get your communion elements ready so that you will be able to partake in communion um, after the message has been given. Also, just a quick reminder as well to have your devices on speaker view mode. And if you are on in video mode, please remember we can see what's um, in your surroundings and you want to be comfortable with what we can see. So we're going to be heading into our communion and offering messages now. And uh, this week, the message is going to be delivered to us by um, someone who, if there was an army of Jesus on the earth, he would be regarded a Navy SEAL. Um, Mr. Mac, are you there? I'm here, Paul. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. I'm doing well, thanks, Mr. Mac. Um, did you play any golf this weekend? Yeah, I played, I played on Saturday and it was very hot. So, uh, yeah, it was average. <laughs> I, I knew you were working up to releasing a bad score, but anyway, <laughs> uh, are you ready to deliver what the Lord has put on your message for us this morning? Yes, yes. Uh, the Holy Spirit will lead, I believe. Amen. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time it is, saints, and welcome to church. You know, um, that last song, yeah, it, it, it said it all. I know the blood is still the blood. The blood of Amen. Jesus is still the blood. And you know what it said? What worked then still works now. It still works. It still works. It is still flowing. It still heals. It still cleanses. It paid the debt I owe. You know, just, it just fits into the message. The community message that I, 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 I trust the Holy Spirit will be leading through me because we are called to remember. The communion message calls us to remembrance. But you remember, uh, saints, one can and one will only remember what, is, what one has previously known, what one has previously heard, or what one has previously understood. You can't remember what you don't know. So we called to remember the word of God, what it said about us, what it said to us. So that's what I would like to share to today. So that simply, as simple as the word is, as we go through the scriptures, it actually tells us what to remember. And this message uh, today is divided into two important parts, uh, the, the, I, I, what I regard as the two important parts. And what we should remember is, first is salvation and then healing. Which is what the word brought. So yes, let's 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 start by reading, and it's very clear. John three verse sixteen from the Amplified. You're on mute. Sorry. Thank you. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son, that whoever believes and trusts in Him as Savior shall not perish but have eternal life. Thank you. You know, so simple. That's how scripture is. That's how the good news is. That's why it's good. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world. Saints, we are called to remember that, that God greatly loves us and dearly prizes us. Then he gave us Jesus Christ. We were called to remember that. But why did he give us Jesus Christ? So that whoever believes and trusts in him as our savior, as our Lord, as the son of God, shall not perish but have eternal life. Amen. We will have eternal life. Let's remember that. Let's go to the next scripture. John 3, 16 from the TP, uh, TPT version. It's the same one, but it's a different version from the TP, T, TPT version. For here is the way God loved the world. He gave his only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. Amen. The, the, the first one said, we, we, we will have. This one says, we experience. So we live it, we walk it. Saints, let's remember that it's already done. That price was paid. Christ came in for us to live and experience an everlasting life. But we will go down, as we go down, we will see what does an everlasting life mean. Let's go to the next uh, 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 scripture. Sorry, yeah, that's, that's it. So that's it. Yes. So what we need to remember is that Jesus died for us on the, on the cross and paid a full price for us on our behalf so that we receive salvation. 
saving us from sin, cleansing us from sin. Just like the song was saying, the blood, the blood, it still works, it still flows. So what we have to remember is he died for us to have abundant life. So that's what we want today. Say, what is abundant life? What is everlasting life? Everlasting and abundant life is not just in eternity. It's starting from here on earth. And it goes all the way to heaven. Abundant life or everlasting life is spiritually fulfilling life. It's wholeness in body, in mind, in relationships. But not only does it uh, cover relationships, the mind and, and, and our soul, our emotions, but it covers our, 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 our finances as well. It covers our health. There could be symptoms that we see within the environment or things that we feel. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because there is a devil, John 10, 10, which it says the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. There is a devil trying to fight to steal this peace, this love, this healing, this experience, this everlasting life. But he is fighting us. So when he fights us, we will feel symptoms. When we, he fights us, we will feel in the environment what we call facts. If it's pain, if it's sorrow, if it's sadness, we feel it. We will feel maybe anguish at one point or another. But we have to remember that we are more than conquerors because the blood has already done it for us. Jesus has already done that for us on the cross. So, despite those experiences, despite the feelings, despite what we see by sight, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. So, we need to, to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross, and we come boldly to the throne of grace and claim our full provision, our full provision from all lack, discomfort, or challenges, because we know we are more than conquerors because of Jesus Christ and because of the salvation that he gave, because of his righteousness, which cleansed us, which he clothed us with, which makes it bo us bold to go and claim because we are joined heirs with him in that kingdom, in the kingdom of the Father. So we need to remember. We need to remember. No weapon formed against us as believers will ever prosper as long as we believe in Christ and remain in faith. And we should remember that because if we don't remember it, we won't walk in that freedom. We won't walk in that victory because we will be, we will be full of fear. And God gave us a spirit of love, not a, a spirit of, of fear. He's, we know that we are protected. So we must walk and claim that victory and walk in that richness that Christ provided for us on the cross. My next message, which is part of that communion message, is on the healing, what Jesus did on the cross. And the first uh, verse that we, we, we read, it's very clear from there, you will see, is uh, Matthew 4, 23 to 24 from the Amplified Version. And he went through all... And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news, gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people, demonstrating and revealing that he was indeed the promised Messiah. So the news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were sick, those suffering with various diseases and pains, those under the power of demons and epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them all. Amen. You know, uh, sometimes as Christians, or just as human beings, we, 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 we don't remember what we already know, what we have already been taught, or what we have already uh, uh, been given. So because of that challenge, when we don't remember, we fall short and we miss on appropriating, utilizing, or enjoying that which we've been given. Just simple. If you tell a, a, a kid that after, after your homework, I've already made the dinner or I've made breakfast for you or I've made lunch for you or I've made a snack for you, I've put it in the fridge. You take it from the fridge, put it in the microwave oven, warm it up and eat, and then go back and read, read or study. If they don't remember, they will spend the whole day hungry. That does not mean that there was not, no food. That does not mean that the food was not prepared, but they didn't remember. That's why communion calls us to remember. Because when we remember, we take it. Because it's ours. It's done. Just look, uh, fellow saints, 
They, I, I, I don't have to say much on that scripture. The good news, preaching the good news of the kingdom. And then what? Healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. How come we forget that? When we look at the cross, sometimes we just look at salvation and we forget that's part of it. That's by his stripes were healed. And it's there in the scriptures. So saints, let's remember this revealing what he was, that he was indeed the Messiah. Messiah came to save us from the sins, our sins, from, cleans us, wash us, and to heal. So that, that when that news spread throughout Samaria, they brought to him all who were sick. How did they do that? Because they remembered the news. When they heard the news, they remembered, yes, the Messiah is there. Let's take all our sick, demon-possessed, all those who have pains, epileptics, paralytics, and everybody, the Messiah will heal. How? How? They did that because they remembered. Those that did not remember did not go. And they were not healed. Let's go into the next scripture, Matthew 8, 16 to 17. When evening came, they brought to him many who were under the power of demons, and he cast out the evil spells with the word and restored to health all who were sick, exhibiting his authority as Messiah, so that he fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He himself took our infirmities upon himself and carried away our diseases. Yes. So you see, that's what the scriptures say. When evening came, he brought, they, they brought to him many who were under the power of demons, and he cast out evil spirits with a word and restored health to all who were sick, showing that he's the Messiah. But how did they bring these people to him? Because they remembered. They remembered. They'd been told that that is what the Messiah does. The scriptures were saying from, 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 from the prophet Isaiah, he himself took our infirmities upon himself and carried away our diseases. They remembered the scriptures. And when they remembered, it came to fruition. It was fulfilled. That's what the word does. That's what it does to us when we remember. Let's move uh, to our last, our last scripture on, on the healing, Galatians 3, uh, 13 to 14 in the Amplified. Christ purchased our freedom and redeemed us from the curse of the law and its condemnation by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs crucified on a tree, cross, in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to all the Gentiles so that we would all receive the realization of the promises of the Holy Spirit through faith. Yes, amen. We, we, we receive grace, grace by faith. We receive grace by, 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 by believing in, in the Lord. And let's just remember that. That's all we need to do, to believe in the Lord, have faith, be consistent, be diligent, be focused, and remember, and remember that, he purchased our freedom and redeemed us from the case of the law. We don't live under the law. We live under grace. It's given to us, unmerited, an end. It's free, undeserved. It's free because of his love. So saints, let's always remember. And the, Jesus uh, uh, de declared in the book of John that he only does what he had seen his father do. So Jesus came to carry his father's will. That's what we should remember. God wants us well. God wants us uh, in his kingdom. God wants us saved. God wants us uh, to live a full, everlasting, full life here on earth as well as in heaven. And we should remember he was bruised, crushed, and scourged so that he, by his stripes so that we are healed. And we were cleansed by his blood. So we are freely going to the Father to claim that which is ours. Let's remember that. Despite any symptoms that we feel, despite any experiences that we see, despite any sufferings or any hurt or any, 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 any pressures that we feel, let's remember that it was already done. God wants us to live a full, full life on earth. So we should always confidently expect our breakthrough despite what we see. And this break, the, the, and then the blessings, the blessings from Abraham, the blessings that we received, that, that he gave us, will manifest at the appropriate time. Even if it tarries, they will manifest. So as we take communion, uh, uh, saints, we let us remember that we should always remember, remain steadfast in our belief and in our faith 
on and remember the finished the Christ's work on the uh, that, uh, that that was completed and done on the cross. We should remember to stand on those promises and on the word of God. And like he said uh, in, in, in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, um, um, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Let's remember that. Yes, we are weary. It's not like we don't get weary. It's not like we don't get discouraged. It, it's not like we don't get down because that's where we miss it. We say, so why am I worried? Why am I discouraged? Why am I down? Jesus knows that in this world, because of that evil, the, the devil, the, the, the enemy who comes to kill, to steal and destroy, we will get worried. We will carry heavy burdens. But he says, saints, come to me. Take my yoke. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest in your souls. So let's remember what Jesus did. And as we take communion now, let's remember what he did on the cross. Salvation, healing, full life, abundant life. Amen. We can take, we can take, we can take our communion. Saints, as we are taking communion, yes, we remember. I'll move on to our offering message. And uh, in the offering messages, all I want us to remember and see are godly principles that are at work in our lives. And those godly principles never fail. Let's go to Luke, uh, Luke 3, verse 38, New Living Translation. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Saints, I, if, if I was to say too much about this scripture, I might even mess it. So I'll let the Holy Spirit work in you. <laughs> Just look at it. What it says is what it does. It worked then, it still works, it still works. Amen. The next scripture is Proverbs eighteen sixteen, New Living Translation. Give, giving a gift or can open doors, it gives access to important people. Saints, do I need to say more? Do I need to add? The word says it. Let's remember it. Let's follow it. Let's apply it. Godly principles always work. And then finally, X20, verse 35 from the TPT version. I've left you an example of how you should serve and take care of those who are weak. For we must always cherish the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught giving brings a far greater blessing than receiving. Amen. It still works. It still works. That's the word of God. Saints, we are an online uh, church, and our giving details will be appearing on the screen shortly, and for the benefit of any and all who are ready to give. And after the message, uh, I'll pray uh, for the communion, for the giving, and for us to remember, saints. Just to remember, take it and walk it. Amen.
Amen saints. We serve a good God. We serve a mighty God. And we serve a, a loving God. Father, we come before you to thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you for salvation, for healing, for full life that you've provided for us. And we thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit to enable us to remember. So we come before you today and we make a choice to remember. We make a choice to live the life that you've designed for us. We make a choice to follow your principles. Like Father Jesus, you said, John uh, 14, 15, if you love me, follow my commandments. We choose to follow your commandments. We thank you, Holy, Holy Spirit, for guiding, guiding us, for teaching us, and for showing us the way. Father, we thank you for those that have given and for the giving, to bless, it, to bless that giving, to multiply it, and to bless those that have given. And I thank you, Lord, today that your word will stick, stay in our minds, since your word is a light unto our feet, and is a lamp unto our feet and a light on our path so that we walk the way. We receive your word, we receive your love, and we thank you for being a good God. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you, amen. Amen, amen. I told you, saints, that you are the Navy SEAL in the army of God. Pastor Mike, thank you for that powerful message. And um, you know, it's evident that you were you are dwelling in the word because at times you were breaking into amplified English, even yourself. So that was, <laughs> that was amusing. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, that message, Pastor Mike. Um, Saints, this Sunday, we are privileged to be slap bang in the middle of a Makamure sound system with regards to gospel. Um, so we're now heading into the main course and uh, I want to welcome Pastor Mrs. Mack. Um, greetings, Pastor Mack. Good morning, Apostle Paul. How are you today? I'm doing very well, doing very well. Just enjoyed the message um, that has been delivered by Mr. Mac. So we, we believe you're going to continue and, uh, you know, continue walking us through the book of Romans. And, you know, I was just thinking to myself that this book in its singular form, if people were to pay attention to it, could destroy the religion that we're struggling with um, just from what you've taught us so far. So looking forward to today's installment and uh, please feel free to take it away. Amen. So it's the book of Ephesians. Uh, we started a while back and we are still continuing on it. It's a book that is so full of the revelation and the application of our new or in Christ realities. Uh, a book that every believer must be drenched in the moment they get born again to launch them off into this ever victorious life. This life in all its abundance, which Mr. Mark was talking about. Um, without the knowledge of who we are in Christ and what we have in him and what we can do through him, we will be saved but stuck, which was my story for a good part of my Christian walk. I was saved, all right. If I died, then I would go, I would walk straight into heaven and Jesus would welcome me. But on this earth, I continued to live just like anybody. I, I suffered the same things that the world was suffering from, the lack, the discouragement, the sickness, the, uh, the guilt, the condemnation, the shame, the regret, and I could go on and on and on until I started to get a revelation of what was my new reality in Christ Jesus. So that's the book that we are, uh, we are doing that in the book of uh, Ephesians now, uh, which really I encourage all of us to, uh, as, we, as we read this particular book and as we read any other book of the, of the Bible, to just focus and look out for the will of God, the work of Christ and the witness of the Holy Spirit. So basically that's what we are doing as we delve into this book as, and as we draw out these new creation realities or these in Christ realities that we are supposed to live in the consciousness of. And it's just the consciousness of, of those truths that will effortlessly transform our lives to become these victorious and abundant lives that God called us to live, these victorious and prosperous lives that Christ paid so dearly for on the cross of Calvary. So we, we, were, we are looking at the in Christ realities up to uh, as, of, uh, as of last week, we covered in Christ reality one uh, up, to, up to 20, 
uh, the first interest reality being that we have been forget we, we are born we were reborn into a new identity in Christ. The second one being that we have received the abundance of grace in Jesus Christ. The third one being that we are we already have the peace of God, the peace in God, and the peace of God. And then from Ephesians one verse three to fourteen, we dived straight into in Christ reality number four which is that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places by Christ Jesus. Um, number five is that we are chosen in him. Number six is that we are holy and without blame in him. Number seven is that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Number eight is that we have been adopted as sons, just like Jesus is a son. Number nine is that uh, we have been accepted in the beloved who is Jesus Christ. In Christ reality, number 10 is that we have been redeemed through his blood and we have been forgiven of all our sins according to the riches of his grace, which is in Christ reality number 11. In Christ reality number 12 is that we have all wisdom in Jesus Christ. And number 13 is that we have all prudence also in him. In Christ reality number 14 is that we have been let into the mystery of the will of God. We have been allowed into allowed access to the secrets of the kingdom of God that makes all things work or that hold all things about our lives together. The Bible tells us in Colossians 1, I think around 7, that in him, all things, in Christ, all things hold together and in him, all everything about our lives does consist. So that is the mystery that the, this new or the, this new identity we have in Christ uh, is being uh, revealed to us uh, in the process. This is the mystery of the will of God that is accessible only to, to those of us who are called by the name of Jesus Christ. We also learned about um, interest reality num number 15, which is that we have been brought into a purposeful life. We have been brought into an intentional life. This life that seeks only to glorify God. I always put it this way. I say, I always tell people that I play to the audience of one. And as long as I play to the audience of one, I will bless any other audience that might be watching me or that might be doing life with me at any given moment of my life. Uh, we also learned in, um, in uh, verse uh, 11 that we have obtained an inheritance that in, that's interest reality number 16. We have already obtained an inheritance. We are not going to obtain an inheritance. We have already obtained an, an inheritance. It's a past accomplishment. The moment we were born again, we obtained everything that Christ is and we obtained everything that Christ has. We also learned in that same uh, verse that we have been predestined by God to be conformed to the image of Christ. So Christ, God put and did in Christ everything that he wanted to put and do in us. So we can observe the life of Christ in the scriptures, just like Mr. Mark was doing uh, during the communion and offering messages. We can observe the life of Christ and we can begin to see ourselves doing the same, going about preaching and teaching and healing. That is what Christ, uh, that, that summarizes the ministry of Christ. And it should also summarize the, 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 our ministry or our life here on earth. Uh, in Christ reality number, Number 18 says, we have a hope in Christ. Christ is our saving hope. That saving hope has already done its work in our lives in giving us salvation in the past. So we have been saved by hope, but he continues to be our living hope. Even in this life, he is our anchoring hope. When the storms of life arise, he keeps us anchored in on the rock, on the sure foundation of the word of God. And that is what Christ, the hope that Christ is to us. He is also our future tense hope. The, 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 the Bible tells us that at that blessed day, on that blessed day, when the trumpet will sound, Christ will come in the clouds and the, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are living will be, will be given some glorified bodies. We will, our, these bodies that are, that are mortal, these bodies that are corrupt, will put on incorruption and immortality. And at that point, the redemption, the full work of redemption will be fully accomplished in our lives. So we have a hope in the past which saves us. We have, which we have a hope in this life, in this current dispensation, which continues to save us. And we have a hope in the future, which will save the purchased 
position completely. Um, in Christ reality number 19, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And we spoke about how that sealing is, has a two-pronged effect in our lives. First of all, it identifies us as being of God, made by God, uh, for God, and as God's. And then the second effect of the Holy Spirit, of the seal of the Holy Spirit in our lives, is that it ensures our salvation or it guarantees our eternal inheritance. It guarantees the completion of the redemptive process in our lives. So that's where we left it uh, last week. And so today we are going to continue on to, uh, we, we also spoke about, last week we also spoke about, um, we went on to talk about uh, Apostle Paul's prayer for the church, which is contained in Ephesians 1, verse 15 to 23. And we summarized it as follows. We said, Paul wasn't praying for a troubled church or a church in crisis. He wasn't praying for the church in Ephesus because it was in trouble or because it was challenged, uh, which was the case with the church in Galatia and the church in Corinth. Those two churches were having problems and the epistles of Paul were written to those churches to address those issues. But in this instance, in this particular instance, Paul was writing to a church that was thriving. One whose faith was strong, and whose love for the saints was evident. So this was a healthy church. So he was praying over a mature or a maturing church. He was not praying for a struggling church. He was not uh, praying for a, uh, a failing church. He was praying for a church that was maturing, a church that was mature to an extent. And therefore the, his prayer or he, uh, the, the wording of his prayer tells us a lot about how we should be praying for ourselves and how we should be praying for the church. So the first thing that he does is that he gives thanks. In this prayer for the church, he gives thanks. And that teaches us that thanksgiving should, should always precede petition in our prayer life. Thanksgiving focuses us on God. It focuses us on the good in our lives. It focuses our attention away from what could be challenging. It, it focuses us from the facts and it focuses us on the truth because it's only the truth that will set us free, John 8, verse 32. The other reason also is that Thanksgiving makes or causes us to abound in faith. We read that, and that it makes our faith effectual, releasing the blessing of God on the various aspects of our lives. So when I'm thanking God for my children, I am releasing the blessing of God on their lives. When I'm thanking God that my children are taught of him and great is their peace according to, to Isaiah, when I release those words in thanksgiving to God and trusting my children to God, the power of the blessing of God on my life begins to be released to my children as well. <laughs> He's telling us that thanksgiving must be a crucial part or a, an important part of our prayer life. And also Paul is not praying for God or Jesus to do anything that he hasn't done before or to give us anything that he has not already given. He is praying from the understanding that in Christ, God has already done everything that he will ever do for humanity. And he has already given all that he has to give to for the access of us who are called by his name. So Paul is praying for us to know and to live in the consciousness of what God has already done and what God has already given through the finished work of the cross. So when we consider this kind of prayer, we can see that this is what the Bible calls a prayer of faith. This is what the Bible calls an effectual fervent prayer of a man, which makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. That's the amplified version of that verse. So Apostle Paul is telling us that there is a way to pray for the New Testament believer. That is not like the Old Testament uh, believer. That is not the kind of prayer that the gospel dispensation believers could pray, but we can pray, pray it now because we look back to the finished work of the cross. We are not looking forward to Christ coming again to save us. We are not looking forward to the sacrificial lamb being hung on the cross again, once again for our sins, for our health, for our prosperity, etc, etc. Christ has already accomplished it. And this is the language that Apostle Paul is using in this prayer. We are also, Apostle Paul also prays for us to know and to live in the consciousness of what God has already done and what God has already given us through the finished work of Christ. So he's just praying that 
um, we, we can get an understanding of what this salvation has brought to us or what this salvation means to us so that we can begin to walk in light of that, so that we can begin to see ourselves in light of our new identity in Christ, so that we can begin to see our abilities to do certain things in light of what Christ has done. Philippians 4.13 says we can do all things, not on ourselves or of ourselves, but through Christ who gives us both the strength and the ability. So Apostle Paul is praying that we may awaken to our righteousness. We may awaken to our new uh, uh, creation ident uh, identity and reality so that we can begin to walk in the newness of life. He puts it this way in, in, in another part of scripture. He says in, in Ephesians, he says, put off the old man and put on the new man who is created in God, in true righteousness and in holiness. So this is the prayer that Apostle Paul is praying for us today's the church then the church of Ephesus and today's church that we may start to awaken to our to our righteousness he also prays that um the he also brings to our consciousness through that prayer that everything that we are receiving today is by the work the witness and the ministry of the holy spirit spirit and that is a revelation of what we already are a revelation of what we already have, a revelation of what we can do because we are in Christ. So in all of Paul's prayers, some of them I listed at the bottom there. I'm hoping that you took some time during the week to go and peruse over those prayers so that you can see that all his prayers for the church were from that same premise or that way in similar fashion. He was praying in light of a finished work. He wasn't praying for God to do anything more he wasn't praying for God to give anything more. He wasn't praying for God to do, uh, to abound towards us with anything new. He was praying because God had already done what he could, he ever wanted to do for all humanity. So what were Paul's concluding remarks um, uh, in, in that prayer? His concluding remark was that the exceeding greatness of the power of God may, be, uh, may, may manifest in our lives. So in uh, Ephesians 1, 19 to 23, we read last week that Apostle Paul was talking about this exceeding greatness of the power of God that is towards us who are in Christ. That is the will of God for us, that the exceeding greatness of his power towards us may manifest in the different ways that it manifests so that we can begin to live this abundant life that Christ so paid so dearly for us to have. We read from Ephesians 1, 19 to 23, that this exceeding greatness of his power was towards us who believe. According to the working of this same mighty power, this same exceeding great power, which he already worked in Christ, when number one, he raised him from the dead, number two, he seated him at the right hand of the father, number four, he put all things under his feet. Number three, he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things. Number four, he filled him, uh, he, uh, he, he filled the church with the fullness of him who fills all things, uh, who fills all and in all. So this is what the exceeding greatness of his power has already accomplished in Christ. First of all, it raised him from the dead. Secondly, it seated him at the right hand of the father. Thirdly, thirdly it put all things under his feet and it gave him to be the head of all things, including the church, which is his body. Um, the second thing that we must learn from that passage of scripture is that in like manner, this is what the exceeding greatness of God's power will accomplish in our lives. First of all, it has already accomplished its work fully in our lives, in our spirit man. It continues to accomplish that exceeding greatness of his power, continues to accomplish uh, the work of God or the power of God or the life of God in our souls as we continue to live this life, as we continue to submit to the word, as we continue to renew our minds with the word of God. And eventually, when the purchase possession is fully redeemed, it will accomplish its life-giving power in our body. So in the past, this exceeding greatness of his power has already accomplished the newness of life in our spirit man. In the present, it continues to, ac to, to accomplish the newness of life in our spirit as we live our lives day, from day to day in the consciousness of our new creation or our in Christ realities. In the future, it will accomplish 
that life giving power when this uh, mortal body will put on immortality, when this corrupt body will put on incorruption. And at that time, that's when we will sing with a loud voice, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your power? Why? Because the redemptive work of Christ will have fully accomplished its purposes in our spirit, in our soul, and in our body. So we can see that the greatness of the power of God has already accomplished a lot. I, 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 I can't even describe what it has accomplished in, in Christ's life. And God is, Apostle Paul is saying in that prayer, he is saying, since the exceeding greatness of God's power has already accomplished this for Christ, God wants to accomplish the same for us who are in Christ. So he's, in other words, he's saying, God has already done and put in Christ what he wants to do and put in all of us who are in Christ. So we can see that Christ is our forerunner um, in terms of the working of this greatness or exceeding greatness of the power of God. We can look at the life of Christ and expect the same power to work the same in us until we accomplish uh, until the redemptive, redemptive work is fully accomplished in our lives. So that summarizes Ephesians 1 for us. So in Ephesians 1, we covered interest reality number 1 up to 20. Today, we are going to start on Ephesians 2. Finally, we get to Ephesians chapter 2. So again, as we start this, uh, this, this chapter of the book of Ephesians, I want us to be on the lookout of the will of God the work of Christ and the witness of the Holy Spirit. And in that, I'm trying to give us a constant consciousness. I'm trying to focus us always as we interact with the word to understand always that God is the one who has a plan, who made a plan for humanity. Christ is the one who came to execute the Father's plan for humanity. And the Holy Spirit is the one who reveals that will of God and that work of Christ to us so that we begin to walk in the will of God willfully, intentionally, and on purpose. So in Ephesians 2, we will just do a quick overview before we delve into it in detail. Ephesians 2, Apostle Paul continues to, uh, with the working of the exceeding greatness of God's power in us who have believed. He is carrying on the thought that he has concluded chapter one with, where he was talking about the exceeding greatness of uh, the, the power of God, which um, raised Christ from the dead, which uh, caused him to ascend to heaven and which made him to sit down at the right hand of the father with all things under his authority. So Apostle Paul starts off chapter two with that thought. He continues with that thought and he focuses on what the exceeding greatness of the power of God has already accomplished in our spirit men. So in doing so, he starts off by expounding our sorry state before salvation. So Apostle Paul paints a picture of our life before Christ. In fact, I shouldn't say our life before, before Christ. I should really say our lifelessness before Christ. We were in a sorry state. We were lifeless. And then he carries on to show us what the exceeding greatness of the power of God has accomplished in us in spite of our lifelessness. So he finishes the chapter off by explaining how the exceeding greatness of the power of God delivered us from death in Satan to life in Christ. So that's a, that's a summary of uh, Ephesians chapter two. And um, with that in mind, we are going to start dig digging into that, into, into Ephesians chapter two, just, it, it's really a minefield. We are going to we're going to extract quite some gems from this chapter two of the book of Ephesians, and uh, I can assure you that if you get this chapter, your your Christian life will begin to mean something first of all to you, and then to all those around you. So uh, remember that we are saying the uh, concluding verses of uh, Ephesians chapter one. Uh, Apostle Paul was telling us how the exceeding greatness of the power of God worked in Christ's life to the point at which he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. So he is saying he made Christ alive. Now in chapter two, he starts with us being made alive. Past Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter two, verse one to three in the New King James Version. 
and you he, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath just as the other amen so apostle paul is saying just like Christ was made alive, we who were dead in sin were also made alive. We were made alive by this exceeding greatness of the power of God. In the TPT versions, he says, his fullness now fills you. What is that fullness? Is the God kind of life, the Zoe life, the life of nothing missing, nothing broken, the shalom, shalom life. He says his fullness, the fullness of his life now fills you. Even though you were once like corpses, dead in your sins and offenses, you lived in religion, in customs and values of this world, obeying the dark ruler of the earthly realm. You were disobedient to the truth of God, the corruption that was in us from birth, the deeds and the desires of our self-life or selfish life or self-centered life. He says, whatever natural cravings, thoughts, our minds dictated, or living as rebellious children subject to, the, to God's wrath. So Apostle Paul is painting a picture now of the here, of the, of the uh, then and now. He's saying, then you were dead. You were like corpses. You lived uh, in the religion and customs and values of this world. You lived in deep disobedience. You conducted yourself after the lusts of the flesh or the desires of a selfish, with a selfish end or a selfish mind. And you were by nature the children of wrath. We want to take it again in another translation just to complete, completely get the perspective of what Apostle, of where Apostle Paul is coming from as he begins to introduce the, this, the work of the finished work of this newness of life, the finished work of this exceeding greatness of his power that has, uh, that has accomplished this transformation from death to life in our lives. So in, um, in the NLT, he says, once you were dead, He's talking about us. He's talking to the church at Ephesus, but he's also talking to us, today's believers. He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world, the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way. All of us, there's no exclusion here. Everybody who's born of a woman used to live that way. Some a bit more than others, but we all did. So following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. So we had a nature of sin, which we couldn't help but follow its passionate desires and inclinations. It says by the very nature or by the nature of sin, by, by that nature or our identity of sin into which we were born, we were already subject to God's anger. We were already born subject to God's anger, and then he puts that qualifier for so that no one thinks of themselves any more highly than the rest. He says, just like everyone else. So this was our state. This is the state of all humanity at birth. This is where we God found us. He found us in this dead place. In this, he found us in a place where death reigned in our spirit, in our soul, in our body. We were walking graves. We were the walking dead. That is what Apostle Paul is saying. He says, this is then. This is before you encountered Christ in the gospel. This is before the light of the gospel shone on your path. You were dead. We were all dead. So Apostle Paul is saying, this is how God found us. But he loved us as he found us. He loved us even though we were not lovely. We were not lovable. There was nothing attractive about us. And there's a passage of scripture. I will leave that one. Um, uh, <laughs> it, it, we, were un, we were unlovable. We were unlovable. There, there's, there was no incentive in us to cause God to, to be attracted to us in love. In other words, Apostle Paul is saying God's love was extended to us as a matter of choice within, within himself, not by way of incentive from anything that we were or that we were 
that we we had or that we could do. And so Apostle Paul is really trying to paint a picture of our sorry state before God found us, of our so sorry state when God still came after us, when he still reached out to us. I love that song that we sang um, during worship, which says his blood is still speaking. His love is still reaching out as dead as people may be, as filthy as they may be in their sin. God is still reaching out. So Apostle Paul is saying in in summary, he's saying God found us dead. He loved us as he found us and that he found us dead. He found us dead spiritually. He found us destitute or devoid of life. He found us as corpses. This is the summary of all the versions of Ephesians 2 verse 1 to 3 that we, that we have read. He, we, th that was our state. That summarizes our state before God found us. In Ephesians 4 verse 18, it also uh, uses a wording that makes it all clear that we were alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that was in us, because of the blindness of our hearts. So we were alienated from the life of God. And we are going to, um, we, we want to just uh, take a, a walk down memory lane to see how we found ourselves in this place of being dead. Lest someone might go away thinking, I am dead because I did this. I was dead because I did that. I was dead because I didn't do this. We want to understand where our dead state originated. Where did that death come from? In Genesis 2, verse 17, we are going to read and we are going to convince ourselves from the word that we all died in Adam. We didn't die out of our own choice. We were born dead. We died because the, the father of all humanity, the earthly father of all humanity, Adam, made a choice which was translated from generation to generation to generation in death. Genesis 2 verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Amen. So this is God speaking to Adam, giving him an instruction. He has given him access and ownership of everything that God had created. Adam has free access. He can partake of anything and everything except for this one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God warns Adam. He says, do not eat this from this tree because in the day that you will eat, you shall surely die. Uh, and then we see that in Genesis 3, verse 16, what happened? They went ahead and they partook of that fruit and they ate. Uh, Apostle Paul, Genesis 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Amen. So we see here that they took Adam and Eve partook of the fruits that God had forbidden them from partaking of. And because God had already spoken that the day that they would eat of that tree, they would surely die. So we can see how death came into their reality. They partook of a tree, a tree that would cause them to die according to God's laws of the kingdom or the principles of his kingdom. And when they ate of that tree, they died. Uh, in Romans 5 verse 12, we get a, a, a different angle, a new creation or a, a new uh, testament revelation of what really happened when they partook of that tree, what really happened when they partook of that, uh, of the fruit of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil against God's advice. Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as through, just as through one man sinned, just as through one man, one man sinned, entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Amen. Now we see here that they partook of the, of the fruit, the forbidden fruit. They, they, they sinned because they went against God's advice and God's instruction. Death entered because of that sin. So uh, uh, Romans 5, in Romans 5 verse 12, Apostle Paul is telling us that we were born with this sin nature or we were born dead not because of our personal choices, but because of the sin that entered the world by one man who is Adam. And that sin, that, that sin caused death in that man and that death spread to all men. So we were born dead because of the choice of our forefather, Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21 to 22, 
puts it another way so that we can really understand that we were born dead, not out of choice. We are not re personally responsible for our death or our state when we were born, that state being dead. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Amen. So Apostle Paul is putting it uh, in different wording here. He says, death, death came to all mankind by one man who is Adam. So he also says in Adam, all men die or all men died. So we were born dead because we, we came from Adam who was a dead man. So we in, the life that we inherited from Adam was the life of death. So what are the implications of our death in Adam? God found us dead in Adam already. We were born dead because we descended from a dead man called Adam. So what are the implications of our death in Adam? So we were born already dead in Adam. So the life that we were born with is actually a death life. <laughs> our state of death came with a nature of sin, which was our inherited identity, all from Adam. We didn't choose sin leading to death, these were chosen for us by Adam. Our inherent nature of death as a result of the Adamic sin caused us to sin in our thoughts, in our choices, and in our actions. So the actions of sin or the choices of sin or the thoughts of sin that we grappled with um, in our, before we were born again, and even sometimes after we are born again, are just death in Adam expressing itself in these various ways. So it's not our sins that made us dead in sin. It's our death in sin that made us sin. So our actions of sin or our thoughts of sin or our choices for sin were just a result of the nature by into which we were born or the nature with which we were born or the identity which we carried at birth. So because we were born dead, we were helpless or incapable of saving ourselves. A dead man cannot save themselves. A dead man cannot even ask for a glass of water. A dead man is just that, he is dead. So we were so dead that we couldn't even choose life for ourselves. A dead man cannot choose life, cannot choose anything. Um, I remember one of my teachers, he says, um, he gives an example. He says, um, you know, when a person uh, uh, has been an, an, an alcoholic all his life, in that uh, as long as that person is alive, uh, as in living on earth, uh, if you put a, a bottle of vodka on his table or a bottle of scotch or whatever, uh, whiskey, he's going to be tempted to, to, to take that drink again. Why? Because he has been an, he is an alcoholic and he's got these impulses towards alcohol that he, that he can't control. But the moment that man dies, when he's lying in his casket or when he's uh, in a mug, if you take a crate of whiskey, and put it inside him. <laughs> that man is not going to respond to that, to that thing. Why? Because he's dead. So that was our state. We couldn't even choose anything for ourselves because we were dead. We were helpless to change or to alter anything about ourselves. And the only good, uh, good thing that happened to transition us from that dead state to the live to the to the alive and well in Christ state that we find ourselves today is the gospel of Christ, which availed us an opportunity to choose death or life for ourselves. So we could we could put it this way: we were born dead, not out of choice, but because God is a just God, because God is a fair God, He He did He doesn't want to judge us on the basis of choices that were made for us by another. So what does he do to, to, to level the scales or to equal the scales? He puts choice back on the table for us to exercise the choice either for death or for life on our own. And that comes by way of the gospel of Christ. So we could say the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is God's means of putting choice back on the table for us who are born dead. We get the opportunity to choose life again in Christ or to choose to continue to live in our death or deadly state. So we can say that although God found us dead, he loved us as he found us. Although he loved us as he found us, he loved us too much 
to leave us there. That is why he reaches out to us in the gospel of Christ. So how did God find us? He found us dead under a threefold curse that we find in Ephesians 1, if Ephesians 2 verse 1 to 3 in the Amplified Version, we have already read it uh, before, but I'll ask Apostle Paul to, to read it again, stopping at, the, uh, at each point. Thank you. And you he made alive when you were dead, slain by your, slain by your trespasses and sins, in which at one time you walked habitually. You were following the course and fashion of this world, were under the sway of the tendency of this present age. Amen. So he's saying you walked habitually under this sin or under this death. You were just following the course of or in the fashion of the world um, because we, you were helpless to choose anything else. You couldn't choose life because you were not capable of choosing life. You were dead. You, you, you couldn't uh, uh, express choice because you were dead. Just like that dead man uh, in the morgue or in the, in the casket who cannot reach out and take his most favorite whiskey from the, from the, from the, from the box because now he's dead. So uh, Apostle Paul is saying we were already in bondage to these sins and trespasses that we would continue to habitually walk in because of the nature that was in us. Number two, Apostle Paul. Following the prince of the power of the air, you were obedient to and under the control of the demon spirit that still consistently works in the sons of disobedience, the careless, the rebellious, and the unbelieving who go against the purposes of God. Among these, we as well as Okay, so the second case or the second bondage that we found ourselves in, in that state of death is that we were in bondage to the curse of Satan or to the power of Satan or to the power of the prince of the air, according to that passage of scripture. So we obeyed this demon spirit. Why? Because we were held hostage by him. That death in Satan held us hostage, spirit, soul, and body. And what we did, the actions of sin were just we, we couldn't help but sin. They were an expression of a nature that we had, that we inherited from uh, the, our forefather, Adam. So we were first of all in bondage to sin. And then we were also in bondage to the father of sin who is certain. Then finally, we were also in bondage. Number three, Apostle Paul. As well, among these, we as well as you once lived and conducted ourselves in the passions of our flesh, our behavior governed by our corrupt and sensual nature obeying the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind, our cravings dictated by our senses and our dark imaginings. We were then by nature children of God's wrath and heirs of his indignation like the rest of mankind. Amen. So he says the third bondage or the third case that worked against us was that we conducted ourselves according to the passions of the flesh. The flesh being corrupt and sensual in, in nature and the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind, the cravings dictated by our senses and our dark imaginings. So we were, we, we were, we were, in, we were held hostage by the flesh, by our impulses, by our, by, the Bible calls it lasciviousness in another part of scripture. We, we, were, we were in bondage to the desires, the selfishness of the flesh. So we were born, we, we, were, we were born dead and under this threefold curse or bondage, the curse or bondage to sin is our nature, the curse or bondage to Satan, the author of all sin, and the curse or bondage to the impulses of the flesh. So this is how God found us. And when you think about it, when you, when you go back and really see, look, have an honest look at your life. You can see that all those three worked heavily on you before you became a new creation. You, 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 could, you, you just chose to be selfish. You found yourself being selfish. Uh, and you couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't help but be selfish. You couldn't help but desire to do the wrong things. Why? Because your nature, which is the root, dictated it that way. And so I want us to have a look uh, at different passages of scripture, which continue to show us the state in which God found us um, uh, from different angles. Um, we will read from Romans 1, verse 18 to 21, just to see how Apostle Paul puts it in that passage of scripture so that we can really begin to see our helplessness or our state of death or our, or our state of undesirability that 
so that we can convince ourselves that when God reached out to us, it was not because of any virtue that we showed. It was not because of any quality in us that was attractive to him. It was simply because he chose to love us because of his nature of love. Romans 1, verse 18 to 21. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Amen. So that passage of scripture also begins to, to tell us our state are from a different angle, the state in which God reached out to us, the state in which God found us, the state in which God just chose to pursue us with all of his love. First of all, it says we were completely ungodly and unrighteous. We were haters of all truth. Of, of the word of God. We were irreverent and we were despising of God. We were unthankful and ungrateful. We were futile and foolish in our thoughts and imaginations and our hearts were darkened. This is the place we were when Christ reached out for us. This is how unattractive we were when Christ chose to reach out in love to us. Um, and I was said from a different angle again, Romans 1 verse 22 to 27, Romans 1, verse 22 to 27. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth, for, of, the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burnt in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. Amen. So from that passage of scripture, we can summarize that we were by nature foolish, we were unclean, we were lustful, we were dishonorable, we were idolatrous, vile in our passions, we were lustful and we were shameful. This is how God found us. This is the narrative of our life before uh, we encounter Jesus in the gospel. In Romans 1, verse 28 to 32, we, 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 we see our picture again from a different uh, angle. That passage of scripture says we had a debased mind. Our minds were debased. We were filled with all unrighteousness. We were sexually immoral. We were wicked. We were covetous. We were malicious. We were full of envy. We were murderers, full of strife, deceit, evil-minded, we were whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. We were deserving of death, not only, uh, and we, were, we also approved of things that were ungodly. So that is the picture of our lives, the state in which God found us. I'm sure you are seeing how unattractive we were. I'm sure you can see how undeserving we were of God's slightest attention, but God came through in all abundance towards us. Um, in Ephesians 2, sorry, in Hebrews 2, verse 14 to 15, we get another angle of our state before, uh, before salvation. Hebrews 2, verse 14 to 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Amen. So uh, uh, in that passage of scripture, the writer of Hebrews, who I believe to be uh, Apostle Paul, the jury is still out on who wrote it. I just believe it's Apostle Paul. Um, it's not that saith, that saith the Lord. Uh, uh, Apostle, uh, well, the writer of Hebrews is telling us here that uh, Satan had power over death. 
He is the one who had power over death because he was the author of death. And in Adam, the fear of death held all of us in bondage. We were born dead and the fear of eventual eternal death was just a part of us. We knew, we knew that it, 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 there is an eternity and the thought of spending that eternity in death held us in, in the bondage to fear. And through that fear of death, Satan kept us, held us in bondage or he held us hostage. Um, and because we were held in hostage, we couldn't free ourselves. Why? Because uh, our hands were tied in death. We were helpless to save ourselves, even though we knew that we did not want to, 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 to go on to eternal death. We were helpless to save ourselves. And because of that helplessness, because of our, of our death or our deadness, because of our lifelessness, our deliverance had to be 100% dependent on another who is Jesus Christ. So we were in our worst possible state when, when God found us, when God came through for us. We were in our worst possible state. We were dead and hostage to fear of eternal death. Um, Ephesians 4 verse 17 to 19 puts it in another way again. Uh, it says, uh, you can read that for us, Apostle Paul. There, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Amen. So you've got, you, you see those points one to, uh, to nine that I have in that passage of scripture. Uh, next slide, please. We're going to just quickly go through them. The first state that he found us is in is our minds were futile. In, in other words, we were just born into this moral depravity or perversion that we couldn't help. The second thing that Apostle Paul brings up in that passage of scripture is that our understanding was darkened. Our imagination or mental disposition was just dark through and through. Um, we were alienated from the life of God. We were estranged from God. We were shut out or excluded from relationship with God. There was no hope for us ever having relationship with God because there is no um, communion between darkness and light. There is no communion between death and life. He also goes on to say we were ignorant or lacking in divine knowledge. Uh, he also goes on to say our hearts were blind, uh, stupid, stubborn, callous, dull, blunted or hardened. We were past feeling. We were insensible to others. We were callous. We were apathetic because we were consumed with self. We were given to lewdness or unbridled lust, uh, excessive um, lust or licentiousness or lasciviousness or wantonness or outrageousness, shamelessness or insolence. Or uh, in other words, we, our cravings. Uh, dictated our lives and choices. Uh, and, uh, the eighth thing that he brings out is that we were filled with all manner of uncleanness, of all impurity, of lustful living, impure motives, impure actions, impure choices. We were selfish and greedy and covetous. So this is the state that God found us in. We were this way not because of our own choices or, or, or actions. We were this way because we were born that way. We were conceived in sin and we were born in iniquity. That's what uh, David says in one of his lamentations. So I, I'm trying to paint a picture of how unattractive we were before uh, Jesus found us. Uh, in Romans 5 verse 6 to, 6 to 10, we see another perspective again from Apostle Paul uh, describing our state before salvation. Romans 5 verse 6 to 10. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. So from that passage of scripture, our description, or our narrative, the narrative that applied to our lives then is that we were without strength. We were impotent. We were weak. We were infirmed. We were feeble and helpless. We couldn't even help ourselves. The second thing is that we were ungodly. 
We were irreverent, we were impious, we were condemning of God. We were basically wicked. We were by nature sinners is the third aspect of our lives. We were devoted to sin. We were held hostage by sin. We were preeminently sinful, especially wicked. We were enemies of God. We were hateful of God. We were hostile to him, adversarial to God and opposed to God. This was our state when God reached out to us. And I'm sure you can see that our state was pathetic. Our state was sorry. We were in a sorry state. We couldn't even help ourselves. Uh, if, uh, Titus 3, verse 3, uh, we see another perspective again of how we were when Christ uh, reached out for us. It, it says in that passage of scripture, we were foolish, we were disobedient, we were deceived, we were serving various lusts and pleasures of the flesh and of the world. We were living in malice, we were envious and hateful, and we were hating one another. That is another aspect of our lives um, when, 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 uh, when, when Christ found us. So given that, given this understanding of our sorry state before salvation, how did God respond to us? Ephesians 2 verse 4 to 7, most amazing passage of scripture. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Amen. So I've shown you our before, after, our before picture. I've shown you the narrative that rang true for our lives before our encounter with Christ. Now that passage of scripture, Ephesians 2 verse 4 starts with, but God. In other words, it's saying God's response to us was contrary to our state. It, it's not the expected uh, response to something that is so filthy, something that is so dead, something that is so useless, something that, that is so dirty. It's saying God who is rich in mercy. It's saying God's response to us in that state that we were, in that deadness that we were, he reached out to us in mercy, in great love. He, he loved us. His response was not because of what we were or how we were. His response was in spite of how we were. So we were loved at our worst, loved in spite of not because of ourselves. Uh, and we were dead in our trespasses and sin, like the picture that I painted of our before story. In light of our state, God's response uh, to us seems inappropriate. Uh, there was nothing in us that could warrant God's predisposition of love towards us. There was nothing that we did to earn it, to attract it, to deserve it, or to, or, or, or to warrant it. God just loved us. It, 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 it was an unwarranted love that God extended towards us. In light of the before picture that I've just painted of our lives in Satan or in Adam, God's only motiv motivation to, for, for loving us was just his nature. It was, not, his, it, was it was not motivated from us. He was motivated from within himself. He was moved by his great love out of choice and free will and not out of obligation. So we can see here that God's will and God's nature are one and the same. His, his nature is love and his will is to love in spite of the object of that love. So God loved us. He extended his love towards us while we were at our worst. So we, we can see here that the uh, Apostle Paul is trying to show us how God loves us in them, loved us even in our most undeserving state. He loved us. He loved us in spite of ourselves. Uh, we go on to Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9 to see how, the, how God, that love of God was then extended to us uh, who, once, who were once dead in our trespasses, who were once uh, sunk in lasciviousness, who were once selfish and helpless to save ourselves. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9, this is the good news. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Amen. So he's saying God extended his love, his love for, towards us when we were undeserving. And he's now going on to, to show us how that love was extended to us. The first, uh, the first aspect of that love that was extended to us was the grace of God. And I, I like to use the, the acronym grace to say 
uh, that grace means God's riches at Christ's expense. So God's grace is undeserved, it's unearned, it's unmerited. The only person who, re, who, who earned it or who could have deserved it was Christ. All the rest of us do not deserve it. We did not earn it and we did not merit it. And grace is God's gift to us, the undeserving. So if grace is God availing to us what only Christ deserved. So we can say from this passage of scripture that that grace of God is 100% a gift. It's 100% a gift that cannot be earned, that cannot be warranted, that cannot be deserved by anyone under the sun. So we all receive it as a gift. Uh, Ephesians, we are going to read from Titus 3 verse 4 to 5 to, to get an understanding of how God abounded towards us in this grace uh, and how what other aspect of him was at play when God reached out to us in our sorry state? Titus 3, verse 4 to 5. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we, we spoke up, we spoke about uh, grace being God's riches at Christ's expense earlier on in the earlier slide. So the Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 8 that we were saved by grace. So our salvation is by grace, by God abounding towards us in, 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 in goodness, in love, the kind of goodness and the kind of love that only Christ deserved, but we didn't deserve. So our salvation is 100% by grace and that grace is a hundred percent a gift of God now we see another aspect of that love of God that was extended to us it's saying salvation is according to his mercy so the first aspect was salvation was by grace now we are talking about salvation being according to his mercy so grace is God extending to us things that we didn't deserve now mercy is God withholding from us the wrath and punishment that we really did deserve. So we can see that God's expression of love to us is true, is two pronged. First, it's expressed in grace, abounding towards us with things that we did we could never deserve. And then the second aspect of it is abounding towards us according to his mercy. That means withholding from us everything that we truly deserve. So grace, while grace is a hundred percent a gift from God. Mercy is also a hundred percent gift from God. So, um, so I'm saying this to say the the love of God is almost like a coin. I always use I always want to use the illustration of a coin. That the love of God, if you consider or imagine the love of God being a coin, I'm sure we've all handled a coin at some point or another in our lives um, before before the paper money in Zimbabwe. Now we use we used to have coins and those coins would have two, two faces. We, if they would have the head and they would have the tail. And so um, the coin of, God love, of God's love also has two faces. The one face of the coin of God's love is his grace, God abounding towards us in, in goodness, in love, in, 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 in abundance, in prosperity, in healing, in health, all those things that we did not deserve, that is grace. And then the other face of the coin of God's love is the coin of mercy. God withholding from us all the wrath, all the sickness, all the guilt, all the condemnation, all the judgment that we really did deserve. And so we are going to have a little illustration on the screen now uh, of this coin of, God love, of God's love, just so that it's, uh, it, it sticks in our minds and in our imagination every time we think about God. God, that he's abounding towards us in this love, in this coin of God's love, that is, that has two faces, one face being um, the face of love and the other face being the, uh, sorry, the face of grace and the other face being the face of love. Um, I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if we're still on, can, can I get an indication from someone that we are still on? Yes, Mrs. Mack, we're on. Okay. All right. I think there's a slide that was supposed to come on there. Um, tech team. You are frozen. Had I frozen? Just briefly, yes. Okay. At what point did I freeze? No, you didn't. Um, I think you can proceed. We did not miss anything. 
You're okay. You're okay. All right. Okay. Uh, tech team, if I can have the, the the slide of the the illustration of the coin, please. Tech team, thank you. Uh, if you're having challenges, just let me know so I can proceed. Is the tech team that is uh, having a problem? Okay, all right. So I will proceed. I'm hope uh, hopefully we'll recover them at some point so that they can share that slide. And so um, we can go on to talk about um, now. So we have concluded that salvation is by grace alone, and salvation is also according to His mercy alone. So grace is a hundred percent gift from God, and His mercy is also one hundred percent a gift from. God. God, the slide will be coming up now. I think the tech team has recovered themselves. So you will see shortly this coin that I call the coin of God's love. You can see that coin on one face of it is grace, which is God abounding towards us in love, in grace, and in, uh, in, in all goodness. And then the other face of the coin of God's agape is the face of mercy, which is God withholding from us everything that we truly deserve. And so we can see that the grace that brought us salvation is 100% a gift from God. The mercy that enabled us to be saved is also 100% a gift from God. Now we are going to uh, go back to Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9, uh, where we are going to discover that even the faith to believe in Christ was also 100% a gift from God. So the grace was 100% a gift from God. The mercy was 100% a a gift from God. Um, so Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9, again, Apostle Paul. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of words, least anyone should boast. Amen. So I've highlighted that word, that, in green, so that we can talk about what that word, that, is referring to. It's saying, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So the, the that that is that 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 word in green is referring to is the last noun in that passage of scripture. So it's talking about the faith. It's saying you have been saved by grace. Uh, you, by grace you have been saved, and then it goes on to say through faith. And now it's saying that faith is not of yourself. So it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone. Uh, should both so the so faith is the understood subject to which the word that is referring to. So that passage of scripture is telling us that we needed supernatural faith to believe something which our senses could not perceive. So that faith to believe in the unseen, that faith to uh, to, to believe in a God who we could not perceive through the senses, that supernatural faith to put our trust in God through Christ was a hundred percent a gift. Uh, and a lot of people struggle with the concept of us receiving faith as a gift to even believe. And I, I, I always want to remind us uh, that, you know, I, I kept saying we were dead, we were dead, we were dead. And because we were dead, we couldn't even choose to believe in God. We were incapacitated to even believe the gospel. We could not believe the gospel in and of ourselves. We needed help to believe that gospel. So God gave, gifted us with the faith to even believe. How did, did we receive that gift of faith? The Bible says in Romans 10 verse 17, faith came by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when the gospel was preached, infused in the gospel was this supernatural faith that we received together with the gospel. So that is how we received the gift of faith initially. And then secondly, the, the Holy Spirit Spirit supernaturally softened our hearts to believe and to receive, just like in the parable of the Good Samaritan that we spoke about a few weeks ago, that the oil of the spirit is what softens the skin, the wine skin, so that when the new wine is poured in, it doesn't break. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts, to give us the ability to receive, to believe and to receive is the, uh, another way that the gift of faith came. So we were gifted with the faith for salvation through the preaching of the gospel and the initial ministry of the Holy Spirit. So even the faith for salvation was a gift. So we have said grace is 100% a gift. This mercy that saved us is also 100% a gift from God. Now we are saying the faith to even believe for salvation was also 100% uh, a gift from God. So 
what we ask, what I'm trying to convince us is the, the whole work of salvation in our lives was completely and totally a gift from God. There was no part for us to play because we couldn't play a part. We were dead. We couldn't participate in that. And when we read from Romans 5, this 15 to 21, we will see how the word gift, free gift, gift, free gift is mentioned so many times in that passage of scripture, just cementing this, this truth that I'm sharing with you today, that the work of salvation was completely and totally a gift from God. Romans 5, verse 15 to 21. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, which what more the grace of God, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in, the, will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's or disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So you can see from that passage of scripture how the word gift and free gift is so common throughout. Uh, we, we said salvation is only by the grace of God, which is a gift. Salvation is also all according to the mercy of God, which is a gift. We have just concluded that salvation is received only through his gift of faith, uh, gifted to us by the coming of or the hearing of the word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, in that passage of scripture, Apostle Paul is emphasizing that the whole process and the whole work of salvation was totally a gift from God. It did, we could not participate in this because we were helpless to participate. We couldn't participate. And even if we could, our participation would corrupt the process. So it, it's just as well that we were so dead we couldn't participate. And the, the picture that I'm trying to paint is that we always remember that as we started in Christ, by God's grace, by his mercy, and by his faith, all of which were gifts, we continue in him. By his grace, which is a gift, by his mercy, a gift, and by his faith, which is a gift. Ephesians 2, verse 3 to 6, uh, in the message translation, we, we will get the understanding that it was all a work of God. Everything concerning our salvation was a work of God. Salvation is only by grace, a gift. It's all according to God's mercy, also a gift. It's only by faith, which is also a gift. Ephesians 2, verse 3 to 6 in the message translation. It is a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. The words that I want us to really zone in on is he did all this on his own with no help from us. So if, why is that important? Because it puts us all at the same level. Uh, I like to put it this way, at the foot of the cross, the ground is evil, uh, is even. It's just dead bodies at the foot of the cross. And the more in reaching out toward us uh, from the cross and from the resurrection and from the ascension, he, he infuses his life in us and on us all on his own. He, we couldn't help him because we, were, we had no ability to help. We were dead, we were helpless, we were lifeless. We could not help. And God reached out and saved us all on his own with no help from us. Uh, so we are saved. Now that we understand that we are saved by his grace, 
according to his mercy, through faith in him, all of which were gifts. Now that we understand that he did all this on his own, so we had no work to do or we had no performance to do in order to end this salvation. There was zero performance on our part. It was all God's performance. Now that we have understood that it was not by works, it was not by our performance, we did not earn or deserve it. It was all a work of God. Christ earned it and deserved it on our behalf. Now we want to understand that how God views works in light of that salvation. Before our salvation or at our salvation, it was all a work of God. Shall it continue then to be a work of God now that we are saved? Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. So it says we are his workmanship. The new creation is his workmanship. We became the new creation because of the work of God. And we, are, we have just concluded that the new creation or, the, or our salvation or our translation from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light or, for, or our translation from death to life was all a work of God from start initiated it by grace according to his mercy through his gift of faith. We now understand that he continues to sustain it by grace according to his mercy and through his gift of, of faith. But we, we, we also concluded that by the exceeding greatness of his power, God will complete according to his mercy through the gift of faith. Now that we have understood this, that it is all a work of God. How do we require the last part of that scripture, which says we were created in Christ for good works, uh, which God prepared beforehand uh, that we should walk with them. So we can see from that passage of scripture that we were not born again out of good works. We were not born because we performed goodness, good works, but it's telling us that we were born unto good works or we were born for good works. We were created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in other words, God had a life, uh, a lifestyle that he expected of us. But because we were dead, we couldn't live that life. So he had to bring us, to make us alive in Christ so that we can now begin to walk according to that life that, that God had um, uh, in place for us. Ephesians 2 verse 10, uh, next slide, please. We are God's workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God pre prepared before that we should walk, walk in. So there is no right place for works in our faith walk. Works are not a means of salvation. We were dead and we all know a dead man can't work. So before salvation, before we were born again, before we, we received the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, the, uh, we couldn't work to end salvation. Works had no place in the picture. We were dead and we couldn't work. We couldn't work for our salvation. We couldn't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. Any attempt by a dead man to appease a holy and righteous God is what the word terms dead works. So when a person is not born again and they are attempting and trying through give, giving to charity, through uh, any pious work that they may do to end right standing with God, the bad calls them dead works. Why are they dead works? Because they are being done by a dead man. So we didn't and couldn't do good works or end salvation. No amount or quality of work could ever measure up to God's standard. So salvation is all a work of God from start to finish. How now that we are saved, the Bible is telling us in that passage of scripture that we are saved unto good works or for good works. So God had ordained a certain way of life. He ordained a certain walk which is which are being uh, that work is being termed good works in that passage of scripture, and those good works a, a dead man was incapable of. So God gave us life; He infused us with His own life, so that we could begin to do these good works that He had for, before ordained for us who are in Christ. So good works are a result of our salvation; they are not a means to our salvation. Good works are a fruit and not a root of our salvation. So that puts works into perspective. So there are dead works, which are works that a dead man can try to do to end relationship with God. They are dead. Then they are good works or works of faith, which a man that is alive in Christ 
is expected to walk in or is expected to overflow to others in because of the life of Christ in him. So um, what, what, what is Apostle Paul trying to tell us? He's trying to tell us that up to the, uh, up to the point of our salvation, we were dead. We couldn't work, we couldn't earn our salvation. At the point of our salvation, it was all a work of God. By grace, through according to his mercy, through faith, all of which were a gift. Now that we have been saved by grace, according to his mercy, and through faith, he is saying we have been, we have been given the ability to do the good works that God ordained for us to do. So we are not um, saved by works, lest any man should boast, should boast, but we are saved unto good works. Why? Because God has given us the ability to walk according to that. To, to his plan, this plan that he ordained before uh, for us to walk in uh, all along in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Um, perhaps maybe let me take you back, um, Pastor Mike, to the beginning of today's message. Um, okay, firstly, I'm revising our Romans series, so Romans is also at the very top of my head, um, but, uh, but anyway, um, at the beginning of this teaching, I was, um, you know, taken to the issue of unanswered prayer. Now, you know, in Christian circles, the issue of unanswered prayer is a very big topic. and all those kinds of things. Now, I wanted to ask, because as you're talking about the in Christ realities, I was thinking to myself that if someone doesn't understand the in Christ realities, even a point of departure for your prayer is probably going to be off a wrong foundation. Uh, maybe you can just expand on that a little bit. Amen. You're very right, Apostle Paul. Um, and I can testify. Uh, that I um, I received very little answers to my prayer before I got a revelation of my impress realities, what the rebirth means to me. Um, because I was praying amiss. The Bible tells us that you have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you ask amiss. <laughs> so that's a recipe for an answered prayer. Uh, and, but then it goes on to say, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man uh, availeth much power dynamic in its working. So there is an effectual prayer or a fervent prayer of a righteous man which releases power into our situations and circumstances. And then there is also another prayer which is a prayer which is amiss, which is not effectual, which does not release anything into our circumstances. So the prayer, the right prayer for the new creation is a prayer that looks back to the cross. It's not looking to forward to God performing anything that he has not already performed. It's not looking forward to God giving anything that he, has on already, he hasn't already given. It's a prayer that, that seeks an enlightenment or an understanding of what we already have in Christ. That is a different kind of prayer. And it's not a prayer that is petitioning God to do something anew in our lives. because. On the, at the cross, God did everything that he's ever going to do. He has availed everything that we, we will ever need. The Bible tells us that, uh, I think it's 1 Peter 2, 3, where he says he has given to us all to life and to godliness in Christ. So we already have all things. So what should our prayer be like? What should our prayer language be? What, we, what should we be saying in our prayers? We should be, first of all, thanking God that he has already us of our sins, that we are no longer uh, condemned, that there is no longer, uh, there's, uh, there's therefore now no condemnation for us who are in Christ. We walk not after the flesh, but after the, after the spirit, for the spirit of, for the law of the spirit of life is set us free. Thank you, God, for my freedom. Thank you, Father, for provision. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sin. Today, I live in the consciousness of righteousness and the holiness of Jesus Christ, etc., etc. And uh, where you are not seeing those things manifesting in your life, you are not going back to God to say, you haven't given me this. You are saying, I know you have given me this. I know this is my, my, my portion in Christ. I know that this is my reality. Your word says by his stripes, I was healed. And if I was healed 2000 years ago, it means today I am healed. If I was made prosperous at the cross where Christ became poor, so that I through his poverty might become rich 2000 years ago, it means I'm prosperous today. 
if I was made free at the way back then when Christ bought my freedom from the hostage of Satan, it means I'm free today. So if I see anything in my life that doesn't align to those new creation realities or in Christ realities, my prayer is God open the eyes of my understanding so that I can learn how to receive what you have already uh, dispatched or what you have already abounded towards me in Christ. That is the kind of prayer for a new creation uh, for, for, for a new creation or for a believer who understands these interest realities. We are saying, I am already blessed. So my prayer is not going to be, God, please bless me. Please bless, uh, bless my food, bl bless my work or whatever. Because God has already said in Christ, I have blessed you with every spiritual blessing. So whatever name you choose to call that blessing, God is saying in Christ, I have already blessed you in the past. So you can, uh, you can also see from the language that Apostle Paul uses uh, in this book of Ephesians that it's all in the past. He puts everything in the past. He's saying you are saved. You were accepted. You were chosen. All those things are in the past. So for me to be praying for God to choose me is a prayer that is amiss. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a petition that is amiss. For me to be praying for God to bless me is a prayer that is, it's a petition which is amiss. And that kind of petition, even God can't answer because if God could be confused, he would be confused. He would be saying, but I've already, what are you asking for? Uh, or you'd be saying, I've already made you prosperous. So what are you asking me to do? So if God could be confused, he would really be confused by a lot of the prayers that we, that we pray simply because we have not understood and we, uh, our interest realities, let alone we have not started to walk in, the, in them. Uh, completely answered. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, that explanation. Um, so saints, we are now at that uh, section of our proceedings where everyone can contribute. Um, you are welcome to ask questions. You are welcome to, uh, to make comments on the lesson that has just been delivered. Um, and while you guys are getting ready with your questions, your comments, your contributions, I'm just going to read a couple of um, contributions that have come in um, by way of text. So Mrs. Mack says, there's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. His blood still speaks. His love is still reaching out. Hallelujah. And she goes on to say, the blood is still the blood. It still washes. It still cleanses. And she says also, Jesus healed them all. We've got Noctula who said, we need to remember that Jesus has already done it all. We are totally redeemed. Amen. And Moses says, lo, inventors of evil, Mawan. <laughs> Mr. Max says, in our dead state, we were very useless, powerless, ineffective, that our deliverance could only come through another, Jesus Christ. He also says, we were given, we were given the faith to believe so that we are saved. Wow, all was done for, for us as a free gift from God through Jesus Christ. So, yeah, saints, you can uh, come to the participants area. Mr. Mack, I see your hand is already up. Do you want to give us your contribution first? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you, Ashtag Suti, for the word. It was, it was very interesting, very inspiring, and also it's quite foundational in terms of understanding where we were, where we are now, and where we are supposed to be going. As, as now, we, we, we do the work, works as a fruit, as a byproduct of having received this salvation, having received this grace, having received this love. What, 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 what was quite interesting to me from uh, Ephesians 1 to, uh, all the way to 10 was Christ made us alive. But you know what? God found us dead. He found us dead. And in being dead, there was nothing that we could do for ourselves. Receive, understand, or respond. And you know what, as, as that's thinking, uh, uh, saints, uh, whether we like it or not, there's one thing that comes out of a dead body. In time, it's a bad, foul smell. It's actually repulsive or repelling. But despite all that, God so loved us so much that he gave us life. When we were dead, cleansed us, gave us life, in, and made us alive with Christ, raised, raised us up 
together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ, all in Christ. You know, what, what gifts, what kind of gifts is this? You know, I cannot even fathom, I cannot even think or imagine, I mean, the kind of God that we serve, the depth, the breadth, the height, or, 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 or the width of that kind of love. But, and then he gives me all the authority it's giving me to receive, to enjoy, and for it to manifest. All I have to is to, I, I, I have to confess it, receive it, acknowledge it, and it will manifest. So all I can do is thank God. And I think this was a, quite a revelation to, to me. The sad thing is, when I, if, if I do understand that he loved me when I was dead and maybe foul smelling and whatever, whatever, how, how come that at times now being born again, when I walk through or I pass through challenges, I think he doesn't love me as much or he doesn't love me much more. Because definitely he loves me much more now that he has made me alive, that he has cleansed me, that he has saved me, that he has redeemed me and that he has brought me into his house. So if we just remember that, I mean, this was a powerful message. We, 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 you know, we never walk alone, amen. Amen. Thank you for that uh, powerful contribution. Um, Brother Shenje, are you there? Yes, I am there, uh, my brother Paul. Um, I would like to say to Pastor Mark, thank you so much for this message. I think um, what was going through my mind when I was um, listening to these messages, I think I was just thinking that, you know, if in this life, if you have a friend who lies to you, who cheats you, you know, you probably take time to really get over that, you know, but this dead man who has been, I uh, think, who Pastor Mark brought out from the word is uh, a man who had a list of defects, some of them, you know, which we can't even say if a uh, thing amongst ourselves, I can't even call those names uh, to 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 uh, someone, even if they are uh, like that, you know, I can't call those names. But to to think that that's the type of man who the Lord went after and uh, went on to love and to save and to make things worse is, you know, this man was not even aware that he was like that. Mm. So. When I listened to that and when that was uh, brought open into my heart and into my mind, you know, it, it can only get me to a position where I now start to value this life which Christ has um, freely uh, thing he got given to us, you know, that this was the position that I was and this is the position that I am now. Then you know, the, 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 the only uh, 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 words that can come out of my mouth are just praises and thankfulness and, you know, that eagerness to try and find out more of what this life is really about. And also the concern for others who are still living under this shadow and this life that the truth of the matter is, this is what these people are like. And they don't even know they are like this. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, um, Brother Moses. Um, I'm seeing no hands up at the moment. So I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Mike if you could just, as you did in the beginning of the teaching, maybe link for us the transition from chapter one into chapter two, again, just in summary form, so that people get a grounded understanding of where we are right now with regards to the book. Amen. So the the conclusion of chapter one was uh, Apostle Paul drawing our attention to this exceeding greatness of the power of God, which um, raised Christ from the dead, caused him, gave him a glorified body, which he lived in for the last days of his life on earth, and then caused him to ascend into heaven and caused him to sit at the right hand of the Father with all the authority to rule and to reign over all creation. This is the work of the exceeding greatness of the power of God. 
in Jesus Christ's life. And you know what I always say, that I always say that Christ is the forerunner of all the sons of God. So Christ is the pattern son, or Christ is the prototype of the sonship into which God has brought us. So we are looking at how that exceeding greatness of the power of God worked in the life of Christ, who was a hundred percent man uh, before the resurrection. And he was also a hundred percent God, um, just like now we are hundred percent men in our physical nature, in our humanity, but we, in our spirit men, we are 100% like God. We have the Holy Spirit in us. So uh, that exceeding greatness of the power of God worked a work in Christ's life, which Apostle Paul captures at the end of the book, uh, of the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. Now, the beginning of the second chapter of the book of Ephesians, Apostle Paul is now saying, this is the same work that the exceeding greatness of the power of God has done in your life is doing in your life and will continue to do in your life until the uh, redemption of the full purchased possession. He's saying that exceeding greatness of the power of God is infusing his life into our very being, into every aspect of our lives. Into It has already done its finished work in our spirit man. Our spirit man has already been uh, made alive in Christ. Our soulish man is being made alive in Christ according to the rate at which our minds are renewed and our lives are transformed. Our bodies are also being renewed as we continue to resist sickness and disease, etc., etc., as we continue to, to, to live in health or receive healing when we fall sick, as we continue to walk in prosperity, in peace and freedom, etc., etc. But that work, that exceeding greatness of the power of God will only complete or finish its work in our bodies at the uh, when, when we receive at the final redemption of our bodies, when we receive our glorified bodies, just like Christ did. So we are on a pathway. In the past, the exceeding greatness of the power of God has already accomplished a full and complete work in our spirit. Man. It is continuing to accomplish the work, the power, that exceeding greatness of the power of God is continuing to accomplish uh, uh, a work in our present life going into the future. It will fully accomplish its work when we receive our glorified body and we are uh, 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 this corruption or this mortality will put on incorruption and immortality and we will receive this body that we will live on uh, in for the rest of our lives in eternity. Amen, amen. Thank you for that. Saints, we are running out of time now and um, I'm just asking the uh, tech team to get our ministry slides ready and the administrator slide. And while they're getting that ready, I've got one more question, um, Pastor Mac. You know, as we're going through this book of Ephesians, the one thing that keeps coming into my mind is that the teachings you are giving us um, and the revelations we're getting, you know, one can't get these from a casual relationship with the word. Um, and I'm thinking that a lot of the reasons why we are not seeing ourselves walking successful Christian lives is because our relationship with the word of God is superficial or too casual. Um, and I'm getting this just from the kind of detail you are sharing with us through this, uh, the lessons that you're giving us now. Maybe you can just expand a little bit with regards, you know, the importance of us having more than just a casual relationship with the word of God. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 very, it's a very uh, important point that you raise, Apostle Paul. Um, it's one thing to know about God. It's one thing to know about God. It's powerful in its own way, knowing about God. It's powerful in its own way, but knowing God is a whole nother story. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a different ball game altogether. Knowing about God is a superficial relationship. You, you know God at a distance. You are not intimately involved with God. You, 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 most of the time you are, you, you are reading the word you are just reading the word. You are not studying the word. We, we were never called to read the word. The Bible says um, we must study to show ourselves approved. A workman would need to be ashamed, correctly dividing the word of truth. So we are called to study the word. And why, why do we study? You study in order to draw meaning and benefit from anything. So when we study, we, when we study the plants, for example, we want to see how the plants can be beneficial to us. That is the whole point of us 
studying uh, plants. We study um, about animals. We want to see how animals can make our lives better. Uh, we want to see what food, uh, uh, what nutrients we can get from what kind of meat and what, what, what kind of meat does us uh, no good in excess, etc, etc. So the purpose of studying anything is to benefit from it. You don't just study to pass the exams. Hopefully you are studying to, for whatever subjects you are studying to make a difference in your life. So this is what we are called to. We are not called to read the word. We are not called to mentally ascend the word. We are, told, we are called to studying the word, deriving and drawing out from it these mysteries that God hid in the word for us so that we can begin to walk in them and to benefit from them in this life. And so this, uh, you cannot get to that place of living in the consciousness of who you are in Christ if you don't dig deep into the word to see what God says about you, uh, we must understand that it's God who is introducing our, uh, I always say this, that the episodes are God, uh, God's way of introducing us to the new us. So if you are not going to study, you are never going to know this new man. And if you are never going to know this new man, you can never walk in everything that God created you to walk in. So that, can, that kind of understanding of the God of the scriptures and the mind of God when he penned the scriptures and his expectation of us as he does so can never come from a casual relationship with the word. It comes from an intimate relationship with God through his word. Amen, amen. Thank you for that. Um, if the tech team could bring up the slide that shows the ministries that we have running. Um, so we have prayer meeting every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. And this is delivered via Zoom. We've got marriage and relationships. That is on Wednesdays from 6 p.m. to 7.30. Again, delivered via Zoom. We have a men's fellowship on Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m delivered via Skype, and we have the ch children's or kids' church on Sundays between 8.15 and 9.15 a.m. And also, if you have any questions or queries with regards to the ministry, um, please contact our administrator, Fina. Uh, the number is displayed on your screen, and she'll be able to give you any further information with regards to the ministry, Grace and Faith community. And I will just come back now to Pastor Mac and ask you, perhaps to give us the takeaways that we should uh, meditate on over the course of the coming week. Amen. Um, so as we go away this week, I just want us to, to be encouraged um, by the truth that we gleaned from the teachings that, from the teaching that we received today. The first point being that um, Jesus didn't die for the good little troopers because there were none. He didn't die for the good men because there were none. He died for us when we were still dead in our sins. So none of us ever earned or deserved God's love and acceptance. We never could. We could not, it was impossible. Um, God didn't love us because we were lovely or lovable because we were not. We were dead in our um, trespasses. In another passage of scripture in the Old Testament, um, God put it, puts it this way. He says, you were exchanged to my nostrils. Uh, but in that being exchanged to his nostrils, he still reached out to us. So we couldn't free ourselves from the hostage of Satan or from the hostage of sin or the fear of death because no hostage has ever freed themselves. A person in hostage must always depend on another to pay the ransom price and to purchase their freedom. So we, can, we also concluded that salvation is totally and completely God's choice and action from start to finish. We said, we were are saved by grace, which is a gift from God. We were saved according to his mercy, also a gift of God. We were saved through faith, also a, a gift of God. So the only response expected of us is just to believe and to receive. And our salvation is and has always been by grace alone, according to his mercy and through faith alone. It has been like that. It continues to be so well into eternity. Amen. 
Amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you for that powerful teaching. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Mr. Mack to uh, close for us in prayer. Thank you. Let us pray. Father, we are before you today in highly, preciously given thanksgiving. We thank you because of your love. We thank you because that's who you are. We thank you for Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for salvation. We thank you, Jesus, because by grace through faith, the faith that you also gifted us, everything is a gift. We are now saved and we are proudly called children of God, joined heirs with you, Jesus Christ, in the kingdom of God. So we thank you, Lord, as we pray, we are asking for revelation knowledge and wisdom to know you more intimately, to understand your word, to walk in your word, to live in your word, knowing that if you loved us when we were dead and we were deep down dead in sin, when you loved us at that point with that kind of love, how much more do you love us now? How much more do you care for us? How much more do you provide for us? How much more do you cover us? And how much more have you blessed us? We receive that in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, to reveal to us so that we, the, this word, this love, this, this great, great uh, agape love, so that we are persuaded to choose to walk in your ways, to choose to abide in your word, to choose to abide in you as you abide in us. So we thank you that we be, with this revelation knowledge that we, we are loved, we are great, greatly treasured, we choose life and we walk in this life. And as we walk, we produce the fruits of the spirit as provided, as uh, uh, given to us by you. So we look forward to today, tomorrow, and the rest of the week. And we look forward to long life, abundant life, full life. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. 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 Saints, have an awesome week ahead, and uh, may we continue to seek a deeper revelation of our in Christ realities so that we may walk more effectively as ambassadors of Christ. Amen.